and its sister organization, the International Monetary Fund, are very special organizations. They are sitting on top of the world's wealth, which was put into a secret account, and it has more gold than anybody knows about. And it is cloaked in secrecy. The bankers do not own that money. It's held in benefit for humanity. World Bank and the IMF are listed on a special agreement that was signed in 1950 about that. A assets, it's gold. It's more gold than people know about. It's over a million metric tons of gold. And uh, the World Bank and the IMF have a special role to play, making sure that that money is spent to the benefit of humanity. So where's the gold? A lot of people, some people believe that the gold in Fort Knox has disappeared. Um, that's been in question for many years. Congressmen have attempted to get an audit of the gold in Fort Knox. Um, so a million metric tons of gold is not something you can just hide. Where would you say that that gold is being stored? 400,000 metric tons are in the Central Bank of the Philippines. There's over 200,000 metric tons in Union Bank of Switzerland. And some of that gold is buried securely in the Philippines as well. Some of it is held in various banks, but the bulk of it is in the Philippines. So the World Bank holds the note on that gold? No. It is in a special trust account that was set up by Ferdinand Marcos, and the authorized signatory is a German banker lawyer by the name of Wolfgang Strzok, who also lives in the Philippines. So how do, how do the people get the gold back? If, if it's their gold and it was taken by these bankers, how do we receive it? That is, that is the question. And they're just sitting there illegally and refusing to relinquish it. Part of the problem is that it's, this gold is cloaked in secrecy. But in the last month, uh, Wolfgang Strzok has been publishing all of the documentation. So it's there for people to see. We have the originals. And people just have to make sure that the banks do what they're required to do, which is release the world's wealth. Contact Phoenix Journal Review. Independent confirmation of the Philippines gold. Throughout the Spanish occupation of the Maharlika, members of the Tagay and Taliano clan have been visiting Europe since some of their relatives were English and Austrian. From 1866 to 1898, Prince Julian Macleod Taliano who became title holder of OCT, 01-4 in 1864, had also been frequenting the Vatican. In 1934, under Pope Pius XII, the Vatican negotiated with a member of the Filipino royal family, the Christian Taliano clan in the Maharlika. An agreement was reached that 640,000 metric tons of the Taliano gold would be lent to the Pope. This was part of that gold accumulated by the Southeast Asian Srivijayan Majapahit Empire during its glorious reign of 900 years. In 1939, two members of the Taliano family and a Roman Catholic priest, Father Jose Antonio Diaz, brought the gold from Kota Kinabalu, Sabah, to the Vatican. After doing this, Father Diaz went back to the Maharlika and resided in Cabanichuan City. After World War II, he facilitated the safe return of the 640,000 metric tons of gold from the Vatican to the Maharlika. Manuela Cuni Rojas, a relative of the Acuñatagi and Taliano clan, then a congressman, and Bishop Enrique Sobra Pena Sr., in the presence of attorney Lorenzo Tanyada, received the Golden Manila. Having gained the trust and confidence of Father Diaz, the Taliano clan made him the main negotiator and trustee of their gold. Father Diaz, in turn, hired the services of attorney Ferdinand Marcos, then a highly recommended brilliant young lawyer having attained notoriety when he successfully defended himself in the Naloon Dasan case in 1939. The Taliano clan paid commission to Father Diaz and attorney Marcos in gold, 30% from the principal of 640,000 metric tons. In 1949, 
the two richest men in the world were Father Jose Antonio Diaz and attorney Ferdinand Marcos. Between the two of them they legitimately earned and owned 192,000 metric tons of gold. Ferdinand Marcos withdrew their share of the gold from the central bank and minted it, RPCB. Sometime later, Father Diaz and Marcos brought their gold to Switzerland, in the Swiss Bank Corporation in Zurich. The remaining 400,000 metric tons of Taliano gold is in the third floor basement of the central bank minting plant in East Avenue, Quezon City. Gold for gold, dollar for dollar, this country, the Maharlika, is the richest country in the world. During a talk show in IUS TV the week following the bombing of the New York Twin Towers, President Bush was asked this question, which is the richest country in the world today? With a smile he said, the Philippines. On April 9, 1973, Marcos said. My earthly goods have been placed in the custody and for the disposition of the Marcos Foundation, dedicated to the welfare of the Filipino people. Briefly explain what the impetus was for you to speak out. What did you see? I was a lawyer and I saw securities fraud. I saw financial information that was not being disclosed to $180 billion worth of bondholders. It was my job to make sure that the financial statements were correct. What exactly, you know, where was this money being laundered to whom? The money was going every which way because anybody that reported misconduct was fired. So in one case, the borrowers were being over overcharged. In another case, I was reporting corruption in the Philippines. $900 million worth of money that should have gone to fight poverty in the Philippines instead went to a corrupt man, Lucio Tan, who was in default on his loans. Philippine National Bank went into default. There was a run on the bank. Philippine National, uh, the in investment uh, company tried to bail out the bank for 500 million dollars and then the board was lied to and my story is about trying to uncover the cover-up the cover-up went all the way to congress and then it went to 188 ministers of finance so this is corruption in the entire world and until it's set straight what we're going to have is we're going to have a currency war it's just sitting here doing nothing it's enormously impressive but it's a bit fit for humanity World Bank and the IMF are listed on the special agreements that were signed in 1993. It was in fact a dictatorship that built up over two decades, fell down in a matter of days. Only hours before Ferdinand Marcos resigned his presidency in disgrace, he had himself sworn in for another term and joined his remaining followers and his wife Imelda in song. It was a swan song. At the same time, Cory Aquino was being inaugurated as president too. And today, as the sole leader of the Philippines, she began to look beyond the trauma of recent weeks. Since we have been fortunate enough to have very few victims in this struggle, uh, I hope to continue it that way. And uh, certainly Mr. Marcos is leaving will contribute uh, to relaxed, uh, a, re a more relaxed atmosphere and we can start healing wounds. I knew that was pretty rich and that is why
why I was telling him, why are you in politics with all this wealth that you have? Early on, on, almost on day one, I knew he had more money than people thought that I expected that he had. Yes. And, uh... Chair, your um, lawyer's feeling that this is a fishing expedition? Yes. We've come to the fort area. It feels about a million miles away from the slums of this city. And we've come to meet a living legend, Imelda Marcos. For 20 years, Ferdinand Marcos was president of the Philippines. And alongside him was his formidable wife, Imelda. Part glamorous assistant, part mother of the nation, occasional government minister, and constant presidential companion. Their grip on the country was absolute. For 14 years, the nation lived under martial law and thousands suffered human rights abuses. But in 1986, fed up Filipinos threw them out. They fled the country, leaving behind a strong whiff of corruption and a closet full of shoes. This feels a little bit like walking into the lion's den. <laughs> the lion might be elderly and a little bit fragile, She's still a lion. Come in. Thank you. Wow. Have a seat. an extraordinary room. I feel rather underdressed. Emelda Marcos's living room is beyond plush, and you instantly appreciate why her name has become a byword for extravagance. This is made out of pearls. The whole room drips with lavish indulgence. Well, most of it. And of course, many Filipinos accuse her of accumulating this collection with their money. I was hoping to talk to Madame Imelda about her love of all things lovely and how she acquired them. You have just extraordinary treasures just in this room alone. Could you talk us through some of the paintings? What, who, who's the... Uh... The Madonna? The Madonna is who's that artist? That is a Michelangelo Madonna. I think this is a Michelangelo. Michelangelo Madonna. And and this one? That's a Pizarro. Pizarro. And then over here, this is a Picasso. Picasso. Yeah. This is a Gauguin. That's a Gauguin. Yeah. How did you manage to get so many extraordinary, lovely things? Well, my husband was a uh, the lawyer of uh, gold mines and um, also a gold trader and he loved gold mm -hmm. so much he would always tell me sweetheart he said it's hard to earn money uh -huh. honestly and properly but harder still to spend money properly you be the one to spend and then I said why and then he said to me because all you buy is beauty. It sounds like a, a perfect relationship then. He, he earned the money. Yes. And you spent it. Spent it, right. And I just did not leave it in gold. I bought paintings, beautiful jewelry, beautiful silver, anything beautiful. But when, when President Marcos was uh, acquiring all this money, and giving it to you to spend. Did you think it was his money or did you look on it as money, the money of the Philippines, of the Philippines people? Oh no, I knew it was his money because I saw this gold already in his home. You were rich even before you became... He was rich. ...leaders of the country. He was rich, oh definitely. And that has always been Imelda's line. Thank you. Her husband, Ferdinand Marcos, was a staggeringly successful investor in gold who made billions. We didn't use the Filipino treasury as our own personal cash machine. And if you think we did, prove it. And so far, despite hundreds of court cases, no one really has. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your shoes. They found no skeletons in my closet. 
they found beautiful shoes made in the Philippines. <laughs> Imelda is back, loud, proud and beautifully shod. And she does appear to be genuinely popular with some Filipinos. The Philippines government has seized more than 400 million pounds from accounts in Switzerland. But the puzzle of her remaining riches is locked up in bewildering legal cases and contested documents. Let's look at this. This is only so this one. is an envelope with Belgium on the front of it. The mysteries, what could this be? So this is some sort of treasury certificate. It's a slightly fuzzy... <laughs> no, you don't anymore because this is dangerous already. <laughs> no way. Look. If only I had a photographic memory, I could tell you what it was. But it's... Oh, no. Alright, we can't show you. <laughs> But it shows deposits in the name of Ferdinand Marcos mm -hmm. in a bank in Brussels, yes. and it's for nine. It's for nine hundred and eighty-seven billion dollars. Nine hundred. Can we show the camera? Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> you know. Such a huge sum surely can't be genuine. But with Imelda, who knows? Like armies of lawyers, I failed to unravel the mystery of Imelda's billions. This is shallow waters. But I did get a very interesting and very long presentation on her plans to end poverty and build a tunnel through the Philippines that would solve the world's trade problems. So I'm sitting here tonight with Karen Lewis. Karen, you went to Yale Law School. You were the senior counsel for 21 years for the World Bank. Can you tell me why? What prompted you to become the whistleblower? It was the right thing to do. I had to do it. That was my job. My job was to make sure that people played by the rules. It was a bank and you don't play around when you're working at a bank. You follow the rules. So what happened at the World Bank? When you became a whistleblower, you jeopardized everything that you worked for. Can you tell me what you saw? What happened that made you give up that 21 years that you worked for? I saw corruption. I saw that poor people weren't getting what was coming to them. They were starving. And the reason they were starving was that people were making sure that the money that was intended for the poor was lining somebody else's pockets. It started in the Philippines with the president of the Philippines who was impeached and he had to give back the millions of dollars that he stole. And when I saw that happening and when the, the Supreme Court Chief Justice in the Philippines saw that happening, we were making sure that that wasn't going to continue. But that wasn't, that wasn't what people who were in management at the World Bank wanted. What they wanted was to keep the money flowing in the wrong direction. Uh, he had already uh, quite a stash of, of precious metals. And you, did you really discover it because he used to cover the gold and lead and he... he uh, it was really the, the, old, the old gold was the old gold bullion was covered with lead right and, and the, the walls of the house that the you house, moved in yes. were built were made out of this stuff yes and, is and then I, I i tore it down not knowing what was in there uh because i wanted the house to be to be um, spacious so one day well, let me get and this then one you day got a I, 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 I had the, hacking the walls down it all out i had it all out all the the things all these walls down because it was so Grow oh. up and then walled and so I th threw all these things outside and when he came that day he said where is the wall he was so scared I said I threw it out and then he said uh, where so he ran there and to to my surprise it was gold bullions that was covered with lead that was the way it was before so all the rooms were partitioned by actual yes, gold covered almost been hard to hack, and, and when you were hack, picture hanging you yes. never hit anything there no, you uh, no, no suspicion that the walls were made of gold. Well, because the, the, the walls were also covered with books. 
<laughs> with books, it was clever, supposedly the clever. Yes, that's right. So <laughs> now you must have just gone through the house, turning the walls down. <laughs> Wait a no, minute. No, no. <laughs> What's uh, the furniture made out of? Is it legal to have gold bullion in your house? <laughs> I mean, is that legal? At that point, yes, yes, it yes. is. But they were only angry because there was no tax on it. I mean, because you didn't declare tax. No, because it was not sold. Oh, I see. You don't have uh, to pay taxes. You know, you they were all in place. If for, you just have well, them in your house. Yes, yes you know. There, yeah. That's where everybody gets so angry because this tax yeah, was not that but, high. But that is what we used. That is what we used for our government. Uh, this is. It was all in place worldwide because uh, we just placed it there. Sorry. <coughs> something in your throat. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, I see. Well, I didn't realize you had to... You know, <laughs> but she's machine. choking to death. <laughs> she's choking. Can you slow down a bit? I'm talking too fast.